You know, this morning in um, the class, the Bible class that I was teaching, I began a series of lessons around the theme of love, love in marriage. And in that first lesson I said that for love to last in a marriage, um, it was important to cultivate the kind of love that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love that we refer to as agape love, and a familiar passage worth rereading. If you'll read along with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse one. He says, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind and not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, my message in this series will be that if we cultivate this kind of agape love in our marriages, it will help all the other parts of our relationships to be strong as well and to continue to, to grow. Now once Paul stops talking about love, he goes on to review the great Christian virtues of faith and hope, but he says in the end that love is the greatest of these virtues. So in context, let's just keep reading in verse eight. He says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as also um, I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. My question this evening, therefore, is why? Why? He says faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love. Why? Why is love greater than faith or hope? Of course, in order to answer this question, we must first look at faith, look at hope, so we can compare these to to love and hopefully see how and why love is greater than these. And I have a, a notion that most of you are way ahead of me by now. You know, there you, the wheels are turning. You know, you've probably got your own answer. So stay with me and see if we catch up to each other at the end. If the reasons you've already figured out are the same ones that I've thought of as well. So we start with the meaning of faith. In the New Testament, the word faith referred to two things and the word used and context determined its meaning. Um, one of them, one of the uses is the faith, where in Jude 3, for example, Jude writes, contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. In this context, the word faith referred to knowledge. As a matter of fact, it referred to a body of information concerning the Christian religion. A body of doctrine was called the faith. In Ephesians chapter four, verse five, Paul refers to this faith when he says that there is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So one faith, the faith, the body of teaching concerning Christ. 
He also means that there is only one body, uh, 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 only one Lord, right? There are not five Lords, only one Lord, not, not, not 15 different baptisms, just one baptism. In the same way, there's just one faith, one body of teaching. So faith can mean doctrine or teaching. You know, we keep the faith, right? We tell people, keep the faith. What are we talking about? We mean hold on to and preserve the apostolic teaching that we find in the Bible. And then there's another meaning, uh, this time in Hebrews 11, if you have your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 11, um, uh, that the writer talks about, beginning in verse one. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So this is the other meaning of the word faith. The word refers to a feeling or a decision that we have made concerning a matter. In Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1-3, the writer describes faith as the decision to believe as true and legitimate not only what he has seen God do, but also what God has written in His word. So in this context the word faith means I believe as true such and such a matter, or I believe as true a teaching that I have, uh, I have been given. So faith is the decision to believe as true that the world was created by God exactly as Genesis records it, even if we were not there. None of us were there, nobody was there at the beginning when God created the world, right? Genesis describes God doing that, none of us were there. But the Hebrew writer says, how do, we, how do we accept that information? By faith. We believe that it is true because God has given us that information. We haven't seen it, we haven't experienced it, but we accept as true because God has said this and has explained to us how it was done. So we accept His word as something that is true. Now, the writer then goes on to describe the lives and the sacrifices and the great deeds of men and women who decided to accept as true God's promise of a savior. And they lived and died confident that the promise was sure, even if they did not see it in their lifetimes. So for them, the word faith meant they accepted something as being true. And so for us today, it's the same way. Faith can, be, uh, uh, can mean a body of teaching or doctrine, the faith, usually the article is there. Or it can mean a decision to take God at His word without any other proof necessary. We accept something as true, that kind of faith. So that's what faith is that the Bible teaches. Now Paul also talks about hope, so let's take a look at the meaning of hope. In the same passage where the writer of Hebrews describes the essence of faith, he also makes reference to the idea of hope. He says that faith is the assurance of things that we hope for. Now hope in the Bible is not the kind of wishful thinking that we refer to as hope in modern society. You know, kids will say, well, I sure hope I'll pass my exam. I haven't cracked the book open, haven't spent any time paying attention to the teacher, but boy, I hope that I'm going to pass the exam. You know? That's not hope, that's I wish. There's a big difference between I wish, cross my finger, you know, that type of thing, and hope. Or I hope, you know, we don't do this type of thing, of course, you know, but I, these people that, there's what, 30 million tickets that are sold and they hope that they're going to win the big jackpot. You know? That's not the definition of biblical hope. The term hope in the Bible referred to a sure thing that you fully expected to receive, but you hadn't gotten it yet. For example, You've written and you've passed all the exams and you hope that you'll get your diploma. 
The graduation ceremony is in a month. Now, you don't have your diploma in your hand right away, you haven't walked the stage, you haven't seen it, but you were told that if you pass the exams, you get the diploma. And so by faith, you believe as true what you've been told, and you hope that you will receive the diploma, but your hope isn't wishful thinking, isn't it? Your hope is based on what you know to be true. You've passed the exams, you will receive a diploma, you just don't have it in your hand right away. There's no doubt in your mind that you will have it, you'll just have to wait another month before you know, they have the ceremony so that you can you know, see it and put it in your hand. Well, in the Bible, when someone had hope, it meant that they had full assurance that what they were promised in the future, they would receive when the time came. Same thing as that diploma, same idea. It was Paul's absolute certainty that he would be resurrected from the dead that made him cry out to the Jewish leaders during his questioning by them that he was on trial for what reason, if you remember? The hope and resurrection of the dead. His was not just wishful thinking, boy, I sure hope you know, that I, one day, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I could resurrect? That wasn't his hope. He had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him. He had a true hope. He had an assurance of something that he was to receive in the future. He wasn't just wishing or guessing, he was sure of it and he anticipated it with great pleasure. Just like the guy says, boy, I can't wait till the ceremony, won't it be great, my parents will be there, my friends will be there, I'm going to get that diploma, oh, it's going to be wonderful. Well, Paul hoped for his resurrection from the dead in exactly the same way. My friends will be there, my brethren will be there, the Lord will be there, oh, I can't wait till that day, it's going to be a great day. It's what made him brave, it's what made him faithful in the face of suffering and even death. And so hope is the sinner's reply to those who question their faith in Jesus Christ and their continued service to the Lord um, in His church. For example, someone will ask, on what do you base your confidence that you are forgiven, that you are acceptable, that you are free from sin? And the sinner will answer, my confidence is based on God's goodness and mercy. That's why I'm confident. I see His kindness and mercy towards other sinners recorded in the Bible, and I believe that He did it for them. I therefore am confident, I have hope, that He will extend His mercy to me as well. Why? Because He promised me, and I believe His promise. So my hope is not based on how good I am. My hope is based on, good, on how good He is. See the difference? If your hope is based on how good you are, whew, you're going to have a rocky life because some days you're good and then some days you're not good and then some days you're just bad. But if your hope is based on how good He is, well, He never changes. He's always at the same level of goodness and perfection. That's why it's such a, a marvelous blessing to be able to praise the Lord. No matter what's going on in your life, good or bad, He is always worthy to be praised. He always deserves your praise, your adoration, your thanksgiving. No matter how you feel, no matter how things have gone, it doesn't matter. You can always worship Him. And most Christians, the reason they worship each day, no matter how they feel, no matter what's going on, is because they have hope. They have hope. Someone else may say, well, how and why are you sure that you will be you know, raised from the dead? I mean, you've never seen this done. You ever seen anybody raised from the dead? I've never seen it done. But I respond that my hope for resurrection is based on the power of God that I have seen, not the power I have not seen. I have seen the awesome world that He has created. 
And because I see that, I have hope. I have seen the life that He has created from nothing. And because of that, I have hope. Listen, if He can create something out of nothing, imagine what He can do with something. <laughs> I'm something, you're something. Not a perfect something, but you're something nevertheless. Imagine what He can create with something once you've seen what He's done with nothing. I have seen through the eyes of the apostles the resurrection of Jesus, and I have accepted their witness as true, and because I have that faith, I have hope. My hope for my own resurrection is based on the power of God that has already been demonstrated to me through the eyes of the apostle. He has shown me that He can do it. He has promised me that He will do it. And I believe His promise and His power, and this gives me hope that one day I will be raised to a new and perfect life with Him forever. And that hope keeps me going day after day after day. Hope is always based on God, not on self, and certainly not on the world. Anyone whose hope is based on God and His Son Jesus Christ has the blessed assurance that what God has promised, He will deliver. The one who said, let there be light, and light appeared, has also said, I will raise you from the dead. What takes more power, to create the trillion stars or to raise Mike or Jim or Bob or Helen or Grace from the dead? All right, so we've looked at faith. I believe is true something or a body of teaching, but in this case we're talking about faith. Paul is talking about faith in 1 Corinthians, faith, hope, faith. I believe that something is true. Uh, I, I have confidence in it. He talked about hope, hope, an assurance of something that will be given to us, but we do not possess at the moment. Let's talk about love. The word love has a lot of meanings. Uh, in the Greek language, you use a lot of different words for it, but in the English language, we have one word. You know, we say, in the same breath, we say, oh man, I love Polish sausage, and I love my wife. Whoa, same verb. Same verb, so there, there you have the limit of our, of our language, right? We have to kind of add more words. Well, I don't mean I love them in the same way, you know. But in the Greek language, they have a lot of different words for love, that emotion. They have one word that talks about the love that we have for our friend. I love my best buddy, I love my, my best girlfriend, you know, I, I love them. They have another word for the the emotion that we feel when we love a family member. Not the same way, because we love a family member differently than we love our, than we love our friend, right? Uh, they also have a, another word for uh, the love that depicts sexual desire and sexual intimacy, eros. And then there's another, an, an, another word that we use, um, uh, or they use in the Greek language when they talk about a benevolent attitude towards those who are in need. You don't have eros, you, know, you don't have that type of intimacy love when you're thinking about the poor, and yet you love the poor, you want to show love to the poor. So in the Greek language, a lot of different words explain the different, you know, the different ways that we love. In the Bible, however, the, the word that is translated into the English word love did not mean any of these things. When you say, you know, for God so loved the world in John 3.16, that Greek word that they used had nothing to do with affection for a friend or family or sexual desire or benevolent attitude towards an individual or uh, the downtrodden. They used another word that uh, was actually exclusive to that time. The biblical idea of love referred to a desire for the best for another person, even if it cost us something, that word agape. A shorter way of saying this would be to say that biblical love 
is sacrificial love. I want what's best for the other person, even if I have to sacrifice something in order to obtain what's best for another person. Obtaining the best for another, even an enemy, at our cost. A good Old, uh, Old Testament example was Jonathan, Saul's son, who is next in line for the throne of Israel. But Jonathan gave up his position as prince and heir out of his love for David, who he recognized was God's choice to succeed Saul. There's, he had love, yeah, he had friendship love for David, but he also loved him in the biblical way. Of course, the ultimate example of sacrificial love is Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Jesus leaves His heavenly position to come to earth to die a despicable death so His enemies could be saved. Imagine, not for His friends to be saved, for His enemies to be saved. And for His enemies to have eternal life. This is the spirit of biblical love. Denying self for the good of others. In my class this morning, I was explaining that that kind of love has to be at the core of a relationship for that relationship to work. And the problem many times is that people put something else at the core of their relationships. Things they like together. Oh, you like football? I like football. Hey, let's get married. You know, they put something, <laughs> you know what I mean? They put things that they are mutually fond of. Oh, you're a Republican? Hey, I'm a Republican. Yeah, let's get married. You know, they they put something at the center of their relationship other than this type of sacrificial love. And what happens is they can't build on that. That, that basis, that foundation, you can't build on that kind of foundation. But when the foundation for your relationship is sacrificial love, oh yeah, now you've got a deep and strong relationship upon which you can build. And that's the kind of love that the Bible talks about when it uses this word love. Now, aside from the example of Jesus, God has provided many different ways for us, human beings, to learn about this kind of love experience, not just from listening to a sermon. I mean, that's okay for as far as it goes, you know. But God in His wisdom gave us other things to help us learn about this agape about this sacrificial love. Parenting, for example, is one way to learn about and experience biblical love. I mean, babies that cry and that break up your sleep, young children who run up to you when you've come home from work and you're dead tired, play with me, daddy, play with me, watch me, watch me. Daddy wants to just you know, sit up and read the paper, watch TV, something. It takes sacrificial love to say, you know what, I'm going to delay my own relaxation so that I can give attention to my children. God teaches us sacrificial love in a variety of ways. Uh, I think of um, uh, our dear sister, uh, uh, PJ McCray. Loving her husband, of course, from day one. She's not shy to say how much she loved her husband. But in this time of trial, the serious illness that he's going through, that she's ministering to him day and night, not just for a day or two because he has the flu, but for weeks on end, for months on end. And many of you, I know your, your history and your experience ministering to elderly parents or, or others in your family for years on end. God is teaching us sacrificial love in one way or another. And you know what? I've never, it may happen, it may be true, but I've never heard anybody who's gone through that experience of taking care of a loved one with this sacrificial love over a long period of time. And I mean over a period of years, for example. And at the end, perhaps that individual passes away and you know, life gets back to some sort of normalcy. I've never heard that person say, it wasn't worth it. They say, oh, I'm tired. I'm, I'm just worn out from it. 
and it sure upended my life. I, you know, I had to put everything on hold. I was planning to, I don't know, go back to school or I was planning to build a house or something and I couldn't do it. I had, to, you know, I had to go back and forth 30 miles to my mother's place or 100 miles to take care of her. You know. And yeah, they're tired and yeah, they're worn out and frazzled, more gray hairs, but I've never heard someone say it wasn't worth it. And I've never heard somebody say it made me a worse person. Never, not one time. The answer is always, yeah, I'm worn out. And boy, it was a rough ride. I, 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 don't, know how I, I don't know how I ever got through it and I don't know if I could ever do it again. But I don't regret it because I got to know mom or I got to know dad or I got to know myself in a way that I could never have known myself had this not happened. God gives us ways to learn about sacrificial love. We've all had sick babies, sick parents. We've all had a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, have we not? That you have to love against the grain Some of us had to protect others with our lives. And sometimes all of us have to willingly copy Jesus' attitude in order to cultivate love with someone who is not very lovable. That's how he teaches us. Now Paul, he says to remain in faith and hope and in this kind of love. And then he says that this love is the greatest. Faith and hope, boy, they're pretty important, they're pretty great, but he says love is greater still. Why? Why is love the greatest? Well, there are a couple of reasons, and I'd like to share those, and then the lesson is yours. First of all, love is the greatest because love is eternal. Faith and hope are necessary to bring us to salvation and to maintain our spiritual lives while we are here on this earth. Obedient faith puts us into Christ. All those who are, you know, uh, 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 all those are baptized into Christ, Galatians chapter three. And constant hope maintains our faith, Galatians five. Once we reach heaven, however, faith and hope will no longer be necessary. Why? because we will see God face to face. Revelation 22, four, we don't need to believe as true, we will actually be in His presence. We will also experience the glorified body, that body without sin, that body without death. We will no longer hope for it, we will have it. In other words, the diploma will be in my hand. In heaven, only love will remain. Only the context and the experience of love will be experienced. Because in heaven we will love God perfectly because we will know Him and we will do His will perfectly. Imagine that, think about that for a second. We will be able to do God's will perfectly. No more of these prayers. God, please, could you just let me know what it is you want me to do? If I knew it, I'd try to do it, and then once we know it, how many of us are able to do it you know, all the way? There's always a fly in the ointment. But in heaven, we'll be able to do His will perfectly and experience the joy that comes from doing that. We will love ourselves perfectly, no more self-hatred, because we will be sinless, there will be no shame, no regret, nothing to dislike about ourselves. Imagine the day comes that there will be nothing about you that you don't like. We will love others perfectly because Satan will no longer divide us. We will all be together in Christ perfectly suited and united in perfect peace and love. We will not have to fight the temptation to gossip against each other. We won't have to fight the impulse to begin describing each other in negative terms. 
So love is the greatest because there will be nothing left to respond to in faith, nothing left to hope for. Only love will remain to experience and to rejoice forever. So love is the greatest because only love exists in heaven. Love is the greatest also because, well, because God is love. You know, John the Apostle didn't say God is faith. He didn't say God is hope. He said God is love, 1 John 4, 8. The essence of God's character is love. Love is what motivates His actions and what defines His being. Love is the greatest virtue because to love is to know God ultimately and to do His ultimate will. So if we backtrack on our lesson tonight, faith believes what God says. Hope expects what God promises, but love does what God does. Big difference. Faith and hope are the best characteristics of the human heart. But when a person loves, they become spiritual people and the true children of God. 1 John 4, 16. Isn't it amazing that so many religions in the world put so much emphasis on ceremonies and the way they dress and the smoke and the temples and all. And yet the God of the universe is love and says to us, if you want to be like me, you don't have to get orange chiffon, you don't have to buzz your head, you don't have to burn incense, you don't have to build great temples, you don't have to travel around the world you know, and go up 1,500 steps on your knees, you don't have to do that. If you want to know me, if you want to be like me, then love the person next to you like I love you. Imagine, that's way too simple, isn't it? Isn't that way too simple? All religious people believe and hope in something, but only godly people love as God loves. So love is the greatest because it's the defining characteristic of a spirit-filled person. A spirit-filled person, of course, knows God's word, can't be spirit-filled without knowing God's word, But a spirit-filled person is recognizable in the way that they love other people. The true faith and a genuine hope are expressed in Christian love. Without love, faith and hope are worthless. And then love is the greatest because love is power. Not the hard power of this world. It isn't our faith that has the power to save us. It's God's love that saves us. Faith is our proper response to His love. It isn't our faith or hope that draws people to Christ. It's the love of Christ we show them that brings them to faith and hope and eventually their own love of Christ and others. There would be no faith and there would be no hope if it wasn't for love. Love was first. Doesn't the Bible say He loved us first? Before we loved Him, He loved us. And so love was first and love is last. It's the box set, everything else in between, but it begins with love and it ends in love. And with that in mind, I ask everybody this question, since we're talking about power. Has the power of God's love reached you yet? You know, we live in a world, a very busy world, and now the world is even more upon us because there's so much technology that is constantly speaking to us from so many different places and times. You know, you, you know, you're carrying around your computer in your pocket and they're telling you, you know, there's somebody, some world leader gets shot halfway across the world and you know, six minutes later you know about it, they buzz you. 
So we know about the power in the world. And all of those who are killing and fighting and looting in order to obtain power. And all the political news, right? What's it about? Who's going to have the power in 2016 for four years? But my question is not about that power, it's about the power of God's love. Have you realized it? Have you seen it in your life? Well, ask yourself these questions. Have you eaten and slept in a comfortable place? Well, this is God's love working in you and for you. Have you had others love and care for you? Well, this is God's love working in you and for you. Do you have strength and possessions and freedom? This is God's love working in and for you. Have you received help and comfort and healing in your life? This is God's love working in you and for you. Have you heard that His Son died to pay the price for your sins? This is His love working in and for you. Do you know that He offers you forgiveness and the Spirit of God and eternal life? This is His love working in and for you. His love is working so that your faith and hope can start working. Your faith in God and your hope in God are working if you do believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and that you acknowledge this. Every day you go to God in prayer and acknowledge Christ, the love of God is working in you, stimulating your faith, assuring your hope. You know that God's love has worked in you or will work in you as you have repented of your sins as you have accepted to be buried in the waters of baptism, to put on Christ and put on a new life, who do you think is working there? Not the guy who puts you down. That person is simply an instrument of God's love that He has put there for you. So don't say that your faith and your hope are working if you have not done these type of things or if you are not living in God's love. For faith, hope, and love to come together to produce eternal life, God's love must be there, and your faith and your hope must be there as well. We know God's love is there. We see proof of it everywhere and every day. What is needed is your faith and your hope. If you're not given proof of that yet, or if you've stopped giving proof of that faith and that hope, we always offer the invitation. The invitation is always your opportunity to make a witness. Tonight, I've made a witness in confessing Christ to you and explaining to you some of the things of God. That's my way of making a witness, Marty's way of making a witness. But when you come forward, um, to respond to the invitation, whatever that may be, that's you making a witness of your faith, of your hope, of your love for God. So if you need to make that witness tonight, please don't hold back. Come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.